like to thank everyone for having me. Uh, when Pat asked me to do a presentation at Esau, it was a, a real honor. And at first I was really nervous about like, what could I possibly have to add to the conversation? Um, you know, I'll talk a little bit in a second here about some of my experience with uh, traveling an avalanche train and being an avalanche uh, educator. Um, but Esau is something that I've been going to as an attendee for a long time, and I've always learned so much from people that have spent a very long time uh, as um, oftentimes as either practitioners or scientists in avalanche train. And so it really it felt like uh, some big shoes to fill to um, to even be worthwhile uh, having me talk a little bit. So I racked my brain, which is, uh, is hard for me, and thought about, um, and Pat had some great ideas about uh, some of the information I could share as it relates to avalanches, specifically in the greater ranges. And so that's the presentation I'm going to talk about this evening. Um, and the greater ranges, if you're not familiar with the term, it was popularized by an Italian climber, Reinhold Messner, and it refers more or less to the largest mountain ranges in the world. There's plenty of debate over what qualifies, but generally speaking, it would include the Himalaya, the Andes, the Central Alaska Range, um, a lot of the mountains in Antarctica, uh, but pretty much the biggest mountains that you're going to find. And what I want to talk about is how uh, there are limitations to the skills that we learn in avalanche courses up to and including professional level avalanche courses like a pro one and pro two course that there are serious limitations to these skills. These when you get to the greater ranges, these skills work really well in most avalanche terrain, which is what they're, of course, geared towards. And I'm certainly not suggesting that professional level avalanche education needs to change to accommodate these relatively rare scenarios that you will find when you're in the greater ranges. But just to point out that in the avalanche education, you can get through a group such as ARI when you take a uh, pro one or pro two course, let's say, if you're moving in that direction, you wanna make a living in avalanche terrain, um, that it's, important to be humble and realize that nature is incredibly complex and dynamic and that even when you've maxed out the training that might be available to you as an avalanche practitioner, um, we really have only begun to scratch the surface of the complexity that we'll be faced with uh, in the mountains when it comes to avalanches. Now, um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about just a handful of areas uh, where when you get to the greater ranges, you are going to find uh, shortcomings or limitations in your skill uh, set from your training and experience. And I want to make sure that I realize that this presentation, to mention that this presentation is not exhaustive uh, when talking about all the different factors or risks that you will face in the greater ranges. And also that I definitely don't really have solutions to a lot of these problems. However, I'm a big proponent of risk taking when risk taking is being done in an intentional and conscientious manner. Taking risk is part of the fun of being a mountaineer. It's not all of it, but it's part of what we're doing when we're climbing and skiing in the mountains. But being intentional about the risk that you take and understanding the hazards that you expose yourself to, and therefore being able to make an educated decision, to me, that is the important part. So even though I don't have solutions to all these problems, I want everyone to be aware of them. Because otherwise, for instance, you might take a few avalanche courses and then go and climb Denali, and you might be surprised to realize that all of the training that you have so far did not sufficiently prepare you for the uh, much greater level of risk taking that will occur on a much larger mountain. So some of these limitations that you can imagine in the greater ranges, you know, Big mountains are going to mean big avalanches. Uh, you're going to be an unforecasted avalanche train most of the time, let's say all the time. Um, you, you have all sorts of challenges like this, bad weather forecast or no weather forecast available. Uh, certain parts of the world, you might not be allowed to use different electronic uh, satellite communication devices. However, you know, especially like, you know, the unforecasted train, big mountains, um, you know, that that's something that is not terribly uncommon. But some of the things that I want to focus on this evening are going to be when you're in an area that has a lack of communal history, so a pretty remote area, the hazard presented by seracs and air blasts, 
We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the risks in general when you are recreating in avalanche terrain that is either on or above glaciated terrain. And then we're going to talk a little bit about unobservable or low observable slopes. So that's the stuff we're going to talk about. Uh, this picture is just from a, uh, and these are pretty much all my pictures unless I make a note of it uh, on the slide. This picture, I want to say it was on Mount Foraker, which is in Alaska a few years ago. Um, and uh, the weather was so bad while we were partway through this climb that uh, we kept on, my buddy Rusty and I, we kept on worrying that we were going to get avalanched off the mountain in the night. And so a few of the nights we just found crevasses that had filled in with snow and were camping inside the crevasses, which was pretty cool. Um, but you just didn't want to think about what would happen if uh, the crevasse caved in on you. So if you didn't think of, once you got in the tent and couldn't see what was above you, it got easier to sleep. Anyway, uh, who is Nick and why do I care? Because uh, I, I definitely get that most people don't know who Nick Aiello Copio is, um, which is very understandable. So I put together a little, I don't know, a few notes about who the heck I am. The big thing I would say about who Nick is, uh, while talking in the third person, is uh, I'm a person that I think for being 33 years old, I have a good amount of experience of climbing in the biggest mountain ranges in the world. And I am definitely a person who has one track mind. And while I love skiing and I've been skiing for my whole life, I'm very lucky that I got introduced to skiing early on. I'm definitely more of a climber that skis. Um, and since about the age of 19, I have really uh, formed my life where pretty much every major decision that I make in life, I think to myself, does this get me closer to climbing a lot? Or does this, would this decision make it harder for me to climb a lot? And in thinking in that very uh, binary manner, while it's come with plenty of sacrifices, it has allowed me to do a pretty large amount of climbing. And I'm especially obsessive about going on expeditions. Um, so I'm always talking, you know, ad nauseum about climbing in the Alaska range. And I list some other of uh, the big mountain ranges uh, where I've done a lot of climbing over the years. Um, at the bottom there it says all around good guy with a question mark. I don't know what the question mark came from that. I don't think that was me that put that in there, but the, you'll have to judge for yourself. Um, so so that, that's, that's who I am. And I've been mountain guiding for uh, a little bit more than a decade now. And uh, it's kind of like a bad habit to me. I love guiding so much. Uh, it really is a passion of mine. Um, and at first it was just like this thing that I could do to make money to go climbing. Um, because that was kind of my only goal was going on expeditions. And I started to realize that uh, guiding, while it is definitely not all that it is cracked up to be in terms of, you know, being some sexy job, you know, there's a real reason that a lot of people get into guiding. They do it for a year or two and then they, then they move on. Um, it is, I found that I really enjoy the process of uh, teaching uh, others the, some of the lessons that I may have learned the hard way um, so that they can be a bit safer in the mountains and, and uh, enjoy themselves. Anyhow, as I mentioned, I am definitely more of a climber than a skier. Uh, here's a picture of my leg taken back in March uh, while I was teaching an avalanche course on uh, the fearsome, ferocious John Sherburn ski trail on Mount Washington. And, uh, you know, wouldn't you know it, right after telling my students, like, all right, guys, it's the end of the day. Let's not get hurt skiing down the Sherburn. Man, that would sure be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Well, I went skiing off into the trees to see where some of my students had gone. And uh, this tree, I swear, it jumped out of nowhere and, uh, and it got, and I ended up with uh, different parts of my body on different sides of it. And suddenly I was laying in the snow with uh, my, my leg on opposite, the opposite side of the tree. And my right foot was up near like my right armpit. It had folded itself. Like in my, in my memory, it had folded itself like 180 degrees around. That's probably an exaggeration. Um, but my foot was all turned around and, uh, and my femur was in two pieces. So that was, that was pretty embarrassing. And uh, so I love skiing, but I would never claim to be a, a very good skier, let's say. And this was a very humbling reminder uh, of that. And, um, and so I should also thank the Mount Washington Volunteer Ski Patrol and you know Pat from the Avalanche Center uh, for helping me out on that day. Because uh, I, I ate a big dose of humble pie, a big slice of humble pie. And I also, uh, yeah, I, I needed a lot of help getting the rest of the way down uh, to the parking lot that day. Anyway, um, but, you know, I mean, sure, it's a little bit embarrassing. But the Sherburn Trail, I mean, that, it's, it's, it's ferocious. You know, it's the only triple black diamond 
in New Hampshire. Uh, and little known fact is that more people have died skiing the Sherburn Ski Trail on Mount Washington than on Mount than than people have died on Mount Everest. You know, that's a little known fact. Uh, don't look it up, but you know, it's a it's a ferocious trail. Anyway. One of the things I'm known for, other than dry humor, is uh, is uh, my patented graphs, I would say. And so when I was thinking about this, uh, doing a presentation on this topic, and this is my first time ever doing this presentation, I just finished it up recently, I thought about, all right, I'm going to make a graph that shows all the different uh, hazards, all the different variables in climbing in the big mountains or mountaineering in the big mountains, and we'll put it all into one chart. And uh, I tried to go as simple as I could, and this was the best I could come up with, which is a little bit complicated. It's, it's got some nice colors going on though. So as you can see here, as the mountains get bigger, we have a uh, decreased ability to make good observations and to mitigate hazards through some of our uh, you know, common mitigation techniques. For instance, think about a common technique we use to mitigate or reduce the risk to the group when traveling in avalanche terrain, when skiing on the way down a line, where you might ski one at a time, well, with eyes on. Well, of course, the bigger the slope, the harder it will be to ski one at a time if there are not very many safe spots where you might be able to pull over and stop and keep eyes on the friend. At the same time that our ability to make good observations and practice different mitigations and safe travel techniques is decreasing, our exposure to objective hazard is increasing. The way I sometimes explain it is that objective hazard and subjective hazard are different in that subjective hazard is fun and objective hazard is never fun. Subjective hazard is a risk that you can pick up or put down. So think about when you're skiing down a line and you're going to choose, all right, am I going to take the steeper way or huck the cliff or am I going to go around it? Well, if you choose to take the steep way, then that's your choice and it can be an exhilarating or enjoyable uh, hazard that you can choose to take or not take. Objective hazard, on the other hand, would be hanging out in an area such as, you know, lunch rocks in Tuckerman Ravine or underneath a big, a big cornice on a warm day where something might fall down on you. An objective hazard, simply by being in that location, you're exposing yourself to this hazard. And those hazards typically are not fun. Uh, and in, as the mountains get bigger, the objective hazards, especially overhead hazard, stuff falling on you, uh, avalanche hazard and crevasse fall hazard, uh, these increase um, pretty rapidly as the mountains get bigger. And so we have to figure out where we as individuals, where our risk acceptance level is. And our risk acceptance is going to change from person to person, day to day, and uh, as, you know, as our lives uh, continue to change. You know, the, only, the only constant is change. And so it's important to realize too that while I don't have answers for a lot of these hazards that I'm talking about in tonight's presentation, a good way to think about what uh, kind of recreation you're into is to figure out where you might lie on the, your acceptance of these risks and what is your personal cost benefit relationship with traveling into big mountains where there is the benefit of doing fun things, going skiing or climbing, but there is also the risk of the hazard that you'll be facing. So I'm certainly not trying to say that if you follow Nick's, you know, three weird tricks um, to stay safe in the big mountains, that you'll be okay. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. Uh, but that if we're aware of these hazards, we can figure and we can conscientiously choose which hazards we're willing to accept. Then we can decide where we want to fall on my weird little chart here and make sure that we're choosing adventures that suit what it is we are looking for. All right, when you're in big mountains, you're gonna find big avalanches. And we're all familiar with uh, the destructive force scale that you maybe, or maybe you're familiar with this. Uh, you know, we go over it in a level one avalanche course and it talks about, you know, how many train cars or hectares of forest uh, might be destroyed by a certain avalanche as a way of giving you uh, a sense of scale of how big an avalanche was. You know, but it's like, oh no, my 10 hectares of forest, that's all I had left and the avalanche destroyed it. Uh, they, those destructive force uh, descriptions, I think can be kind of difficult to wrap your mind around. So this is the first time that I'm unveiling to the world uh, Nick's destructive force scale, which is the N scale. And most of the time, uh, you know, I live here in Conway and spend all winter long in the White Mountains. And 
I will definitely say that while we have seen uh, some, we see the occasional N3 avalanche in the White Mountains, a lot of uh, the mountains that will, a lot of the time in the lower mountains in the lower 48, it's of course much more common to see N1 and N2 avalanches. And it, that's not to say that in the lower 48, you know, the, the contiguous United States, that you're not going to see N4 and occasionally N5 avalanches. But I will certainly say that from my experience, when you go to, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, as you go to larger and larger mountains, you're going to see larger and larger avalanches, which on its face makes it more difficult for certain mitigations, such as spreading out when traversing underneath a slope to make sure that everybody in the group doesn't get caught in the same avalanche. Uh, those mitigations will become harder to implement. I want to start off here, you know, when going over the, the different hazards that I talked about a moment ago, like uh, serac fall, air blast, etc. Um, uh, I have a few anecdotes that I'm going to go over this evening, and the, they all will focus on one or two of those uh, hazards, and but we're not going to cover like each hazard bullet point by bullet point as we're going through this evening. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is a fairly recent um, uh, exciting adventure that my friends and I had, uh, and this was in the Aleutian Range, which is kind of where the, if you think about the picture of Alaska, you know, it kind of looks like your hand, and you got the thumb as the Aleutian Islands, and where the Alaska Range mountains kind of peter out into the Aleutian Islands, um, that's where you find the Aleutian mountain range. It's, a lot of people argue that it's part of the Alaska range. Anyway, it's much less traveled than the central Alaska range where you would find mountains such as Denali and the Moose's Tooth. This is about uh, 200 miles away, which is not that far in terms of Alaska, uh, but much, much less traveled. My friend Ryan took this picture when he had just completed a new route on a mountain in the Aleutian Range called the Citadel. And when he got to the top of the Citadel, I want to say they were maybe the 10th team to ever stand on the summit of this mountain. They were, he was looking out to the south across this barren landscape. And almost every mountain that you can see in this picture doesn't even have a name and it has never been summited. And Ryan noticed one mountain in particular that looked the most big and the most scary, which is right here. And he looked at that face, that dark north face of the mountain, and he said, I got to figure out what that thing is. And of course, we got to go climb it. And he got out from the mountains and sent us all the picture of this mountain. And with a little bit of research, discovered that this was the north face of Mount Neocola. And Mount Neocola that is the namesake mountain of the little sub range, the Neocola Mountains. And it had been summited one time back in the early 1990s. And this north face had been attempted once in the mid 90s. And since then, as far as we could tell, nobody had ever been to this spot. And so of course we decided, well, we've got to go try, we've got to climb that face. The face is somewhere around 4,000 uh, or 4,500 feet tall, depending on which map you look at. When you're flying into the Neocolas, you know, we use uh, uh, bush planes that take off on wheels and land on skis to access a lot of the mountains in Alaska, including the Neocola range. And as you're flying in there, you can't help but notice Mount Neocola because it sticks up higher than the rest and the mountain just seems to like take up half of the windshield of the airplane when you're flying towards it. Ryan and our friend Justin and I, we had all done between the three of us, like probably like 40 or more expeditions into the central Alaska range where you find Denali and the surrounding peaks. The thing that we weren't expecting in the Neocolas was the size of the glaciers. Climbing Denali, like I, I used to guide Denali expeditions twice a year, every year, and you spend a lot of time on the Cahiltna Glacier. The glacier is about 43 miles long, and most of it is between one and two miles across. It's a really wide, uh, flat expanse when you're in the middle of the glacier. When we got into the Neocolas, though, we discovered that the glaciers are a lot more narrow and that we were in a very tight valley. So you can see Ryan and Justin down there when we were doing a little recon ski around. And uh, that entire face on the left side there, that is uh, all unclimbed, unskied, and that mountain doesn't even have a name. Um, so email me if you want more pictures of that thing. Anyway, we get into this valley and our bush pilot drops us off. And basically wherever the bush pilot is able to land, like that's your spot. You don't really have much of an option about where you're gonna go. You point on a map to where you wanna try to land and where 
he or she lets you out is, you know, that's what you get uh, because, because it's all about trying to land an airplane that's on skis. So if you thought skiing on the ground was difficult, try going from like the sky to the ground in an airplane that's also on skis. Anyway, we realized we got to, uh, we, we realized we landed in this awesome little valley. We had about uh, a month worth of food and we, we attempted Mount Neocola, got stormed off and then had ran out of food, went home and we came back two years later in 2021. And in 2021, we camped in the same spot on this glacier, which is the Lobster Claw Glacier. And this is a picture on a nice day of what you see above our campsite. This glacier is about a third of a mile across. And on one side of it, you have that big unnamed peak that I just showed, which has about a 3000 foot tall face. And on the other side, you have the east face of Mount Neocola, which is also unclimbed and unskied. And you're camped right in the middle. In 2019, we sat through some famous Alaska uh, Aleutian range storms on, on this glacier. We were in a continuous snowstorm for about 16 days in our base camp. Um, and then after the 16 day storm, we then tried to climb the North Face and another storm came in, yada, yada. There's a lot of storms. So during that 16 day storm, uh, you know, we were hunkered down in our base camp. We heard tons and tons of avalanches, but none affected our camp. But we were camped here. Uh, in this same spot in 2021, we cached a bunch of our climbing gear at the base of the North Face, which is about four miles away. And then there was a storm coming in. So we returned to our camp with our, you know, Snickers bars and, and uh, uh, Twizzlers to wait out another Aleutian storm. It's kind of hard to uh, describe the scale of this east face of Mount Neocola that was above us, though. So I tried to make this uh, kind of crappy little little graph here. So here, here's a little scale drawing I made of, of the bowl area of Tuckerman Ravines. Think about, you know, that big head wall in Tuckerman Ravine, just how stunning it is when you, every time when you get to Hojo's on a clear day and see the, see the head wall of Tuckerman Ravine. And by, for comparison's sake, here is drawn to scale what the east face of Mount Neocola looks like. The face is about 6,500 feet tall, and the slope of it, the average slope angle is a little bit greater than 45 degrees. And we are camped down at the bottom of that thing. So the storm on Mount Neocola, or the storm in the Neocolas is going on. We're hanging out in our base camp. And there's a big, a number of seracs on Mount Neocola, which as we'll discuss, seracs are basically glaciers that are being shunted off a cliff. Unbeknownst to us, while we were sleeping uh, one night waiting out this storm, a section of the Serac on the east face of Mount Neocola calved off. And when the Serac calved off, it sympathetically triggered a huge avalanche on the east face. And we were able to confirm that this happened uh, a few days later when we flew out and could see um, the crown line from, from the air. So the Serac calved off, which is kind of like a gigantic ice avalanche, but then the Serac triggered a snow avalanche where the crown line we, would, we estimated to be about 2000 feet across and the height of the crown or fracture line from the avalanche was about eight, eight to 10 feet thick. More or less the entire east face of the mountain avalanched. And the problem was that we were camped right here at the bottom of it. Basically, it was about four o'clock in the morning and Brian and Justin and I, we were in our separate tents in base camp, uh, fast asleep. And I woke up and I heard this loud noise and I had kind of like just enough time to think like, no, it, it can't be. And just then the entire tent with me inside of it was ripped from its anchors and thrown through the night sky. The tent was instantly crushed tightly around my body and I was just doing cartwheels and somersaults through the air, occasionally bouncing off of the snow, uh, but mostly just in, in the sky, flying through the night sky. And, you know, I've had many experiences climbing or several experiences, I should say, where I thought like, oh man, I might die. But I've only had a few experiences where I was certain that I was about to die. And this was definitely uh, part of the latter, where I was like, well, this really sucks. Where 
when that when this stops, we're going to be buried alive below 30 feet of avalanche debris. And, uh, you know, I get really claustrophobic. So I wasn't looking forward to this being the way that I died. And it was pretty disappointing, too, because we thought, you know, in, in those moments of flying head over heels inside my tent with my arms trapped in my sleeping bag, you know, I had time to think like, well, they're not going to find us for they're not going to recover our bodies, but no one's ever even going to realize what happened to us uh, uh, for days until the storm ends. And we're just going to suddenly all three of us will stop communicating with our family and it's going to take them a while to figure out that we're all dead. So it's pretty disappointing. And, uh, and as I'm cartwheeling along inside my tent, you know, in the blackness, cause it was springtime. So it got, gets dark at night. Um, everything started to slow down a little bit. And I actually thought to myself, like, holy shit, like maybe there's a chance, maybe, maybe I'm going to survive. Cause I could feel that my head and my shoulders weren't beneath the snow when, when everything started to slow down. And I got one of my arms out and tried to rip at the tent fabric that was, that was wrapped really tight around my face. And I thought like, no, there's, there's a chance, there's a chance I might live through this. And, uh, and just as I was got like a glimmer of hope, everything started moving again and I accelerated again and started going tumbling, tumbling, tumbling. Um, and, and this time I could feel it was all snow packed tightly around me that I was tumbling through. And finally everything stops. And when everything stops, yet again, I can move my face. And I start to try to rip the tent open and I can hear one of my friends shouting. And I'm thinking to myself like, holy shit, what are the chances of this? Not only am I alive still, but one of the other guys is alive too. Now we just have one person to find. And, you know, as though we're ever going to find someone, we've got no shovels, no avalanche beacons, no nothing. It's the middle of the night. And then I hear my other friend shouting too. I'm like, what are they saying? And we always joke with my buddy, Ryan, that, uh, that he's the biggest and strongest of the three of us climbing. And we had been, uh, I mean, kind of body shaming him, you might say, by calling him big boy. Uh, based on how much ice cream he was able to eat in the airport as we were flying to Alaska. And <laughs> Ryan was shouting, I'm alive, guys, I'm alive. And my buddy Justin was responding to him, big boy, big boy, float. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just, you know, kind of uh, too good to be true that all three of us were on the surface. And I, my friends came over, they, they kind of ripped their way out of their tents and they came over and helped cut me out of my tent. And here is uh, the aftermath. Um, so in that picture on the left, you can see this is a few hours later when it got light out. Um, that red tent was, uh, was really destroyed too, because all three of us, we ended up uh, flying um, over 300 feet sideways through the air, across, tumbling across the glacier. All three of our tents were totally destroyed. Uh, the red tent was the least destroyed, so we sort of propped it up and, and huddled inside it for shelter. Uh, you can see my tent in the foreground in the picture on the left that I was in. Um, you know, every, every single pole was broken into multiple pieces. And uh, here's a little video clip showing you know, the, the, storm, the storm continued as we had all been uh, you know, blasted away. And our entire base camp was gone. Uh, our cook tent had been destroyed and all of our food had been stored on the surface of the glacier and all of that was also all gone. And, uh, and so we really, we suffered in that location for a couple of days as the storm continued, just sheltering inside of one of the tents. We found some bags that had been blown by the air blast over half a mile away. Um, and we were walking around on the glacier, picking up bits of food and little bits of climbing gear um, that we could find um, to survive to, until the storm ended so we could get, get picked up and get out of there. And the storm ended, there was a little lull in the storm and we called our pilot and we said, you know, Doug, you gotta come get us. And he said, all right, I'll, I'll come in, but I, it, I can only bring my one plane in there. It's, there's another storm's coming. I'm not risking getting any, any of my other pilots, any of them stuck in there. So everything that's destroyed, just burn it and just take you guys and, I can take you guys and a little bit of weight. We'll get out of there in just one plane. And uh, so we did, as he said, we took all of our broken tents and all the destroyed gear and all the, all the uh, little bits of food we could and trash we could find and burned it all and, and got out of there. So anyway, this was an example, I guess, of being in an area where you had multiple hazards. We had this huge 
difficult to observe 6,000 plus foot tall face we were camping beneath, the Serac hazard, which is circled in the picture here. And then also there just wasn't any real, very much communal history to go off of. No one had visited this area since 1995. Uh, and we knew that because Doug, our pilot, uh, Bush pilot, he had been the person that dropped off the last climbers that had been there in 1992 and 1995. And so I guess the real takeaway here is just that when you're going to remote, unexplored, or little explored areas in the greater ranges, there's going to be just so many unknowns and so many different hazards, and that you have to accept a very high level of, of, uh, of risk to, to go to these areas. And there's sort of no two ways about it. This communal knowledge can be really useful, especially for figuring out where to camp. Uh, in this picture, this is um, at the Moose's Tooth, which is in the central Alaska range, only a stone's throw from Denali. If I turned around and took a picture in the other direction, you'd see Denali there. And since I stopped guiding on Denali itself, I've mostly switched to guiding on the Moose's Tooth and in the Ruth Gorge and Mount Huntington and, and other peaks in the Alaska range that are more like ice climbing and a little bit less uh, the uh, carrying a heavy backpack because I'm a little guy and I'm not very strong. Anyway, here at the Moose's Tooth, um, there's a campsite that people camped at for a long time, right where the airplane lets you off on this little pocket glacier. The problem though, is that it has exposure to a couple of big seracs that are above you. And the scale is really off here because of the, the glacier. So the distance from where I'm taking the picture to the seracs over there is um, uh, it's about a mile and a half. It's a really great distance. And so those seracs are much larger than you would expect. Anyway, for a long time, for a decade, everyone just camped where the airplane would let you off. And then one day there was a really terrible tragedy where Serac fall from the left hand of these Seracs uh, caused a massive air blast where essentially the avalanche debris, in this case, ice avalanche debris, uh, compresses the air in front of it. And when that air hits the glacier, it's sort of ex this high pressure air explodes outward. And Mark Ritchie years ago, probably 10 years ago now at one of the Esau events, uh, did a great presentation about this very phenomenon. And one of the interesting things is that if an air blast hits you and you're in your tent, then as we experienced on Mount Neocola, you're more likely to, uh, to suffer a lot of injury because your tent will act as a parachute and the air blast will pick up the parachute with you in it. And when the air blast from this particular Serac fall hit this camp below the Moose's Tooth, uh, there was a, a tent that was ripped from its anchors with two climbers in it. One of the climbers fell out of the tent and survived, but the tent was lofted at a very high distance, uh, apparently uh, 100 to 200 feet off the ground with another climber in it. And when the air blast subsided, uh, that climber fell to their death because they had been lofted to such a height uh, by this avalanche air blast. So that was obviously, you know, a, a terrible tragedy. And, and hindsight being 2020, you could say like, yeah, maybe that's not a great spot to camp out. Um, but on the other hand, when you when the airplane lets you off and the pilot says, all right, this is the spot to camp, and you've got hundreds of pounds of gear, man, it sure is tempting to just set up your your campsite right next to where the airplane just dropped you off. However, a lot of people head to this area, and after that horrible tragedy everyone realized that, all right, we just have to move our tents a, a, a short distance, drag our gear a few hundred yards, and we can camp in a much safer location. These days, people that go to this campsite, which is called the Root Canal on the Moose's Tooth, pretty much everyone follows the, the herd, and they see some other tents or tent sites over to the side, and they drag their gear over there too. None of the people that are camping there were at this site when the initial accident occurred back in 2011, or probably very few people. However, we have the communal knowledge that, all right, this is a bad spot to camp. Let's not set our tents up here. Let's move them over this direction. And that communal knowledge at this area, because it's visited frequently, allows subsequent mountaineers to be safer. Similarly, now we're on Denali here, where I've spent a lot of time, I've done 13 Denali expeditions, which is uh, like nine months I've spent cumulatively on, on the slopes of Denali. Anyway, this is a 14 camp on the West Buttress route. And if you've never climbed Denali, 
Uh, Denali is something that every North American mountaineer should have on their radar, whether you're a climber, a ski mountaineer, a, a split border. Um, it is just such a great mountain and the common route, the West Buttress route, the only people that will tell you that that's an easy walk up route are people that have never done it before. It's an extreme challenge. I've only summited uh, five times out of 13 attempts, which gives you an idea of just how much challenge is involved here, even if you know the route well. Anyway, when you're at the 14 camp, it's kind of like an advanced base camp. You're not that high up yet, so you can sleep okay at night but you're high enough that your body is starting to adjust to the altitude. And after, uh, a, um, when you're at this camp, you're staring up at this awesome head wall here, which is a little bit more than 5,000 feet tall. And that Y couloir up there, you can see is called the Messner couloir, which I've climbed and people have skied it. It doesn't get skied every year, but in good conditions, it'll get skied. It's a huge run. Anyway, we were all, everyone was camping at 14 camp one year in 2012, and it's a campsite where you'll get about 200 people uh, sometimes waiting for a really good weather window before continuing up to the high camp, which is up behind those rocks on the West Buttress route at 17,000 feet. But we were all in camp during about a three day long snowstorm where it snowed maybe five or six feet, followed by a two day long windstorm. We just got battered with winds. And when the weather finally started to clear, we're on camp and we see something pretty horrific coming down this 5,000 foot face. And at, when this avalanche that I'm gonna show you in this video clip occurred, I was camped all the way up in the corner of the camp closest to the avalanche. So here's what we saw coming down that face. Is that gonna come into camp? I think that might come into camp. Oh my God, Jesus. Oh my God. Get out, get out, Paul, get out. What do we do? Get back along the trail. Shit. All right, so as those funny British people uh, showed us there, uh, the avalanche did not quite come in, into camp, but the, the corner of camp where I was, uh, that huge powder cloud came rolling straight through the camp. And everybody was starting to run, but I have a, a serious policy against dying while out of breath. And like, you're not going to outrun an avalanche going 120 miles an hour or whatever. Um, so I knelt down behind this snow wall and day turned to night as this incredible blast of air hit and, uh, and the sun was blocked out. And I sort of, and the snow wall collapsed around me and I sort of just waited for the end. And then the wind calmed down and the snow started to fall down out of the sky. And I thought, oh, wow, it, we actually lived through that. This is crazy. And uh, the avalanche debris ended up about 100 yards away from the camp. And that camp is right about here on the slopes of Denali. Anyway, so that avalanche occurred. And the following season, the National Park Service, which has a uh, seasonal camp at that campsite at 14,000 feet, they said, you know what? Let's all camp, you know, a few hundred yards farther away from that giant avalanche prone slope. And in subsequent seasons too, uh, everyone has continued to camp farther away. And another example of how not very many people that have camped there since 2012 probably remember that avalanche. Um, I, I'll never forget it, but not many people remember that avalanche. However, every mountaineer on that route gets to benefit from the past experience of those who came before them. And as you get to more and more remote mountains, you'll have that uh, communal or passed down experience. You'll have less and less of that, which will force you to make your own decisions uh, to a greater and greater extent, and thus kind of increasing the number of unknowns that you'll face. All right, so I'm talking about air blast and communal history a little bit here. Um, but now I want to talk about what has happened, been going on in all these clips and pictures I've shown so far, which is recreating in avalanche terrain while also on or above glaciated terrain. So in this picture, we're primarily looking at the Cahiltna Glacier down there, and you can see just endless crevasses in this glacier. Um, the, the glacier, as I said, it's 40, this particular glacier is about 43 miles long. Um, most of it is one to two miles wide. And in different areas, it'll be between 500 and 1,000 feet thick. Uh, some areas, it's a little bit thicker than that. Um, so right after this avalanche in 2012, a couple of days later, the weather turned around and it started to storm again. 
And I was assigned to take down a guide who worked for the company I was up there guiding for, Mountain Trip, uh, who had gotten sick with high altitude illness. I was assigned to bring him down to base camp because he wasn't do feeling well. And so when leaving the 14,000 foot camp to go to base camp, it's common to travel through the night because it doesn't get dark during the climbing season. And so we left camp at around 10 in the evening and we started on down. And as we were descending, we descended into a really thick cloud layer as we were descending towards Motorcycle Hill, which is a, uh, a feature on the West Buttress route that's just above the 11,000 foot camp. As we were descending through kind of like the twilight, through the clouds and the blowing snow, we were really, really psyched that with all this, uh, all this recent snowfall, there was a boot pack in the snow that we were following. So we didn't have to break trail, which was great because we didn't have skis or snowshoes with us. Uh, we were just on crampons. So it was really nice not to have to break trail. And as we're coming around the top of Motorcycle Hill, which is at just about 12,000 feet above sea level, as we're com coming around to the top of the hill, we start descending, cresting over onto the hill. And just as we're descending onto the hill, we drop below this thick cloud layer that we were in. And all of a sudden we can see, we were kind of in between two different cloud layers. And to our horror, what we realized we were looking at was the boot pack that we were in, which had clearly been made by a, a relatively large team of climbers because it was so well packed down. That boot pack that we were in continued for maybe a hundred yards in front of us. And then it disappeared into avalanche debris and didn't come out the, the other side. And so here's what we were looking at. Uh, this, these photos are taken from the air a few days later um, of what we were looking at. And I show in that red line in this picture uh, where, the, where the boot pack existed that we were following while descending uh, the hill there. And you can see some climbers uh, dragging sleds full of equipment up the slope a few days later. So you can see the uh, start zone and track and debris of an avalanche that occurred that was not massive. Uh, it was rated as a, a D2 or to maybe D3 avalanche here. And it occurred just off to the side of the common route that climbers take. The folks who made the boot pack that we were following, they got just slightly off route by maybe a hundred yards or so. But the thing that really stuck out to my friend and I, the, the guide I was taking down that night, we were just staring in disbelief because we knew what it meant that the, the tracks went into the avalanche debris and didn't come out anywhere. Um, and we just couldn't believe that such a relatively shallow avalanche could have buried all these climbers. But the kicker here is that the, uh, the buried individuals, uh, four of whom died, they were not in the avalanche debris down at the bottom of the photo. Instead, they had been avalanched into one of the crevasses uh, up high on the slope. So the picture on the right shows the crevasse that uh, five climbers were avalanched into, four of whom are still in there. Uh, there was one survivor from this avalanche who found himself, uh, he regained consciousness inside of the crevasse and he saw that his climbing rope, he was able to dig himself out of some snow and saw that his climbing rope was, was severed, was no longer attached to his partners. And he looked around inside the crevasse and he could see some climbing rope just going into you know, a jumble of ice blocks and, uh, and none of his friends were there. And, uh, and he managed to climb out. And in this picture on the right, to the right, on the right side of that crevasse, you can actually see the footprints of the survivor. He, he climbed out of the crevasse and then he walked around to try to look in another section to look for his friends and, uh, and didn't find them there. And so we, we somehow that night didn't see his footprints, but he was kind of wandering down the glacier ahead of us and made it all the way back to base camp a little bit ahead of us. So the takeaway here, I think, is that when you're on glaciated terrain, if you get avalanche, there's probably no backseas because there are crevasses everywhere. The deepest crevasses can be about 300 feet deep. So even if you get pushed into an average crevasse, let's say, that might be 150 or 200 feet deep, and then you get buried with avalanche debris in on top of you, um, that's, that's not a, going to be a realistic scenario to survive. Uh, you know, it's pure luck that one individual did survive this, this uh, quadruple fatality in 2012. Um, and so a lot of times people bring up the question like, well, Nick, how come like you guys, oftentimes you're not bringing avalanche beacons with you on some of these climbs? Uh, and, you know, of course, 
of course you there's no like you could always say like well it would be safer if you did bring a beacon like that's obviously true however a lot of the time your risk tolerance is that if any avalanche you assume will be fatal because if you're playing the avalanche game on or above glaciated terrain if you get avalanched into one of these crevasses you know that avalanche beacon isn't going to do you very much good um, and and these folks are still in the glacier uh you know 10 years later now all right well that was kind of a downer so now i'm going to talk about uh something uh, another thing which is uh, slopes in the greater ranges that are difficult to observe and then i'm going to wrap it up and see if there's any time left for a couple questions um anyway here are some pictures from a couple of climbs where it can be very difficult to observe slopes that you're going to climb up or traverse under because of the scale. And you can see in these pictures, um, the one on the left is my buddy Justin and our liaison officer Sanjeev. And this is on a trip to the Indian Himalaya in 2017. And you can see in the background, one of the, the icy snowy face that we're there trying to climb. But meanwhile, we're down in, in our base camp uh, where there's grass and brush growing and stuff. Uh, it's a very different environment. And you're, we're trying to make observations of the weather and the conditions constantly because, surprise, you know, spoiler alert, there's no avalanche forecast in the Indian Himalaya. Uh, you're not even allowed to carry satellite communication devices there to call for help in an emergency or walkie talkies or anything. Um, so you're trying your best to make really detailed observations. But meanwhile, the weather could be totally different where you are down in base camp where it might be raining compared to um, the, the peak that you're going to try to climb that might be 10 or 12 or 13,000 feet higher up than you. And uh, the photo on the right is kind of the same situation in the Andes. Um, you can see Justin on the right in, in flip flops in, in the field in the Andes and, uh, and, and the uh, the peak Kitarahu that we're trying to climb in the background above that glacier. Also, the weather might be different below you. Here's a picture from, taken from the high camp at 17,000 feet on Denali. You can see that 14,000 foot camp I was talking about in the bottom left hand corner of the picture down there and some really gigantic crevasses behind it. Uh, the tall summit in the background there is Mount Foraker which is uh, its native name is Sultana, and that peak is 17,400 feet tall. Um, I had some pictures from camping inside crevasses on it earlier. Anyway, uh, it's not uncommon on a high altitude peak to try to actually ascend to try to beat the weather. If there's a small weather disturbance coming in, then by traveling uphill, you may be able to climb above the weather. So as you can see on this night down at the 14,000 foot camp, um, they are in, uh, you know, having a cold, clear night farther down the mountain at, say, Camp 1 and Camp 2, it's snowing heavily down there because they're down in the soup. So if you climb up above the weather and then you have to descend for some reason, the avalanche conditions beneath you could be massively different from what they were at the altitude at which you had been camping. Um, so when you start being able to climb above the weather, you're going to have a really difficult time without an avalanche forecast to figure out what might have been going on down beneath you. And then finally, just a couple of slides showing Seracs. Seracs are sim a similar threat to cornices when it comes to avalanches. And I say similar in that Seracs are dangerous because they can fall on you, uh, which can either cause an air blast or just you could get injured or killed by the falling ice that happened uh, on Denali this past season. But also, seracs are really excellent natural triggers for avalanches because when you have thousands of tons of ice falling down and impacting a slope, that's a great trigger uh, compared to the weight of a skier or rider uh, for a, a trigger of an avalanche. And so that avalanche I talked about on Mount Neocola, uh, we're pretty certain was triggered by a serac because we could see that the serac had a brand new bright blue calving face that had not been exposed to the sun when we left, uh, indicating that it had recently calved off. This Ciroc is on uh, a peak in India called Baihali Jot that Justin and I uh, were there trying to climb. So you can imagine, you know, that this, the wall we're looking at here is a little bit more than 5,000 feet tall. So you can just imagine, uh, you know, the ability of chunks of that, that glacier in the middle um, to trigger avalanches when those chunks fall off. 
Now, um, seracs and cornices, they do differ as to when they are active, right? Cornices are kind of like, cornices are, are, are kind of relatively easy to deal with compared to seracs because of the fact that cornices are, when it comes to when they fall off, it's a little bit predictable when they're going to fall off. They can fall off because you as a human are standing on top of them. That's extremely dangerous. Uh, I've had two different friends die that way, falling through cornices. Um, but when cornices are going to fall off on their, of their own volition, it's usually on warm days in the springtime. Occasionally after a snowstorm, if they've been building and getting much larger very quickly, but more often warm days in the spring. Seracs, on the other hand, they seem to have with no rhyme or reason to the time of day or the time of season when it occurs. There's some indication that some glaciers, which Seracs are just glaciers that are getting pushed off of cliff, that some glaciers do move faster as global, you know, human caused climate change has caused warming and rapid shrinking of the glaciers. But from a practitioner's perspective, I consider Seracs to be just as likely to calve off in the middle of the day as they are in the middle of the night. They seem to have, this is just my opinion, I'm not a scientist, I'm, I'm a, I dropped out, I'm a failed student, so I'll take this with a grain of salt. But in my opinion, the Seracs seem to have so much thermal mass that there isn't a very big change in their activity levels in terms of calving off in the daytime when they're in the sun compared to at night. I think they're just such massive things that they don't warm up and cool down very quickly. But again, that's just my, my opinion. A glacier scientist could probably tell me tell us if that's uh, uh, accurate or total crap. Anyway, Justin and I, we tried, we attempted this face and, and tried really carefully uh, to avoid the Ciroc as we were climbing up there. Uh, we didn't get to the top though, but it was a cool time. And then uh, Mount Neocolo, which I was talking about earlier, this picture shows the north face of Mount Neocolo, which we were there to try to climb on three different expeditions. Uh, and you can see the huge Ciroc on the right side at the top there. There are all sorts of really sick looking ice climbs to do on that, that face and that that, that uh, rock face below the Ciroc is over 3,000 feet tall. It's taller than El Capitan in Yosemite, um, but I'm, you couldn't pay me enough to climb it with that massive calving face of a Ciroc up above there. So this kind of brings us around to uh, that story about getting avalanched uh, in the spring of 2021 on Mount Neocola while, while trying to climb this north face when we were in our base camp below the east face. And we uh, had no food or pretty much no tents or anything left. We lost a lot of gear and almost all of our food in that avalanche. Our whole base camp just got erased. Uh, it wasn't clear when I was explaining it before, but what we believe happened was first, the air blast from the avalanche ripped our tents from the anchors and sent us flying. And then everything slowed down a little bit. And it, we believe it was then the avalanche debris that caught up with us in our tents and started accelerating us again because all three of us separately felt, oh, we're slowing down. Maybe we'll live. Oh, never mind. We're moving again. Um, and we believe that that second wave of energy uh, was the avalanche debris. Uh, I, I wrote a little thing about this in Accidents in North American Mountaineering, which you can read that has a few more details about that particular event. Uh, after that avalanche, though, we, we had to leave. We had to go back to town the town of Kenai because we were out, you know, we had no food. So we, we were pretty hungry for a couple of days. And then we flew out back to Kenai when the weather got, was flyable again. And we ended up going all the way home back to New Hampshire because the weather forecast looked like crap. And we, we wanted to go home and go back to work. Uh, we were all doing um, uh, construction work at the time in the springtime. And then we saw a good weather forecast in the Neocolas again. And we had actually left all of our climbing gear with our bush pilot in the town of Kenai in Alaska. And so about a week after we got home, we got back in a, we went back to Logan airport and flew all the way back to Alaska. And we grabbed our gear, the bush pilot flew us back in. And we spent just one night at that base camp before going straight up to the North face where we actually succeeded in doing the first ascent of the North face of Mount Neocola. It took us uh, seven days of climbing on this wall. The wall is about 4,500 feet tall. Um, it took us about seven days of climbing. It was slow, really difficult climbing on this, you know, brutally cold north face. Uh, we camped a few nights in these inflatable portal ledges tied to the wall. 
you can see in that picture on the left that's looking downward you can see my boot and then that green rope is hanging plumb so you can see just how steep that head wall was um, but it was a, a great experience and uh, uh, to get back there and climb it and then we actually descended that 6,500 foot tall east face that had previously avalanched on us we found a route where we were able to repel and down climb and pretty much avoid the Serac that had uh, had calved off um, a couple of weeks prior. Uh, so anyway, yeah, that's all I've got for you. I think I'm just maybe just barely within my time limit. So I don't know if uh, there's any time for any questions, but also don't feel uh, don't ever hesitate to email me. I'm slow getting back to emails, but I'm a huge nerd and I love talking about this stuff. Um, so it, especially if you've got a, a far flung area you're headed to or you're headed to the Alaska range and you've got questions, uh, never be afraid um, to reach out. The, the uh, Nick at Senate Mountain Guides address worked pretty well for me.